This is Joe Delio from the live community, bringing you the Q&A session from the Global Protect Agent Settings and CIS Controls webinar that was presented by David Cumbo, Aaron McAllister, Shane Markley, and Dan Smith. I'll hand you off, David, now with all the questions. Uh, we'll go ahead and start taking some questions here. So uh, one of them here, can you please elaborate on include uh, Quad Zero access routes and split tunnel configuration? Uh, what does this do and why are you recommending it being added? So it's actually a, a, a it, it comes from uh, older versions of Pan OS where you had to call out specific uh, routes you wanted in the tunnel, I think. And, and Mr. McAllister, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think ever since Pan OS, 7.1, um, it's included by default, but uh, you know, it's just that implicit versus explicit. Um, so it, it's nice that it's implied, but it's better to explicitly call out that, hey, this, this quad zero should be cut over. Um, any thoughts on your end, Mr. McAllister? Nope, nothing really to add. I guess the only thing I, I often encourage is, you know, if you're having any um, any symptoms based on your your testing that seems to contradict what you find in in documentation? Just always triple check the version of both PanOS and the Global Protect agent that you're running. Um, since, as David mentioned, the um, the end user experience and may not um, correspond to the the configuration if you're if you're just looking at a you know a PanOS nine. Dot o version um, and you're reading a 7.1 doc so stating the obvious there but for settings like that and some corresponding features that have evolved and we've been adding enhancements over the last few years just triple check that you're looking at the the right documentation version perfect thanks sir um so question on why is it important to enable ipsec on a vpn versus just the tunnel mode um, so IPsec inherently is a little bit more uh, efficient in tunneling traffic than just SSL. So by default, if you don't enable IPsec, it's going to use SSL by default. Uh, SSL by far has the, the highest level of compatibility on many networks, especially as you travel outside of your house, as you go to hotels or Starbucks or all the other places, which we're not allowed to go to right now anyway. But as you do travel outside of possibly your house, um, or even some ISPs actually limit IPsec connectivity on the firewalls by or on their routers by default. So, um, but IPsec, you know, in, enabling IPsec, IPsec just inherently is a much faster tunneling protocol than SSL is. Uh, so it's just, you know, best to have that enabled. And then if that does not work, it will fail back to SSL. All right. Uh, do, 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 do. So links for the, all the links will be coming out in a PDF version that is going to get emailed out here soon. So keep an eye out for that. Do you have resources for common issues with Global Protect and various OSs? The majority of our users are working, but we have a few Windows 10 users who are getting spinning wheel of connecting, etc. Um, Specific resources would definitely be in that uh, holy grail of, of global protect resources. Any and all resources are generally put there, and that's on the live community. I'll have to dive a little bit deeper to see if we have anything specific to Windows 10. Um, but uh, it sounds like, Maria, you know Mr. McAllister pretty well, too. So he uh, will be able to provide a little bit more follow-up after the fact in regards to exactly what that looks like. But um, yeah, definitely that, that link um, is, is huge, right, for all the global protect resources there. Let's see, we have a few answered that I want to call out specifically to. Let's see here, anything else that uh, any of the panelists want to chime in with? Yeah, this is Aaron. I, I just kind of wanted to elaborate on internal host detection. I think um, that topic was very well covered, but if, there, um, if there's anyone that has had issues or is still spinning their wheels on that particular feature, I just kind of wanted to talk through some common speed bumps there. So um, first and foremost, the 
whatever it is that you um, populate for that internal host, just make sure that it's number one pingable and that it is the type of device that if it goes down, you have bigger fish to fry. I think we use payroll in our example, but whether it's a, a loop back on a core switch or, you know, just it's pingable. And if it goes down, you, you have to resolve that, you know, above and beyond anything related to global protect. So it, it's always up is the point there. Um, beyond that, in addition to it being pingable, the global protect agent will do a reverse lookup on whatever is returned. So just triple check that your forward and reverse lookups match. And um, this is one of the DNS related scenarios that um, is case sensitive. So just double check your DNS servers zone file configuration. And if any of those characters are uppercase, just triple check that they're all lowercase for both forward and reverse lookup that will re more than likely resolve 90% of the issues that might come up at least in initial setup. And then just a reminder that uh, internal host detection is not supported uh, for on-demand connect methods. So if you needed any other excuse to have it be always on, hopefully that will uh, tip the scale. That's all there I got. got. Yeah, cool, thank you. When you update global protect, is local admin access required um, or does it update without any user interaction? So initial installation, excuse me, in, initial installation does require uh, the admin access, but any subsequent updates to the app uh, do not. And you actually do have the ability through agent settings uh, in some of the screens that Dan showed, you do have the ability through those agent settings to um, dive a little bit deeper and, and make the changes to whether you want that to be transparent or manual updates or notify the user or whatever the case may be. Keep in mind though that updates are disruptive for the tunnel, right? So updates do turn off the tunnel, update the application and re-enable the tunnel. So usually it is kind of best practice to have a pop-up and say, hey, Global Protect is gonna be updated. Uh, hit yes to update, right? Um, what are the main differences between the GP app for connecting to VPN and the licensed GP app? So uh, the, the, the application, just a little bit of semantics here. So the, the application is the same. It's the subscription on the firewall and the features on the firewall that are enabled. And I see Aaron posted a nice link to the admin guide, which does break those down. Uh, as well as if you have a chance, check out the live community for the Global Protect Best Practices webinar that we did two or three weeks ago. Uh, and there's a whole slide and a whole section on that webinar. It's also on the uh, live community YouTube channel as well. There's a whole slide and I, I talk, I dive, dive a little bit deeper into the, um, into the chart that uh, Mr. McAllister provided there. Uh, this one's always great, right? We currently a, a, a Pulse Secure in this case, currently a Pulse Secure user for remote VPN. And one of the problems they have is speed for remote user is highly decreased. Uh, does Global Protect have the same issue? So, you know, Aaron's absolutely right in his answer. It's, it really depends, right? If you have a uh, undersized, you know, if you have a PA8, uh, 820, and you are trying to connect 100,000 users to it, then yeah, you're definitely gonna have configuration issues, but are you definitely gonna have speed issues, excuse me. But more often than not, what we see is it's not necessarily the hardware as much it is, as it might be where, where that hardware or where that solution is hosted. Um, and Aaron hits on a very good point, right? So we do have a solution that is cloud hosted. It's hosted on Google's infrastructure. So it's, it's cloud native and it's meant to grow and scale as Google does. Uh, and that's called Prisma Access. And it's essentially a firewall that you manage through Panorama. So if you don't have Panorama, we'll spin up a Panorama instance for you and get you up and running that. But it's a firewall that you manage through Panorama, just like you manage any of your other PanOS devices. Uh, but the difference is that it scales to however many users you need, right? So we have uh, some organizations out there that have over 200,000 end users all connected up to it. And the beautiful part about that, since it is hosted on Google and it does scale, it, you don't need to worry about uh, any, any limitations in regards to bandwidth or utilization. Um, and some of the other advantages you have too is since it is cloud native and it can utilize resources whenever they're needed, um, 
we can also enable stuff like SSL decryption and we can enable, uh, you know, some, some future offerings that are coming, which I can't necessarily talk about in a, a uh, public manner, but you know, some future offerings that are coming will be enabled on there uh, and have no impact in regards to performance. They're just included as part of that user license. So uh, I would be interested though, right? I mean, uh, Mr. McAllister does touch on the fact that hopefully you're doing IPsec instead of SSL. Generally IPsec performance is a little bit faster than SSL, but um, you know, those might be some things to check as well. Uh, of course, we would love to see you utilizing global protect instead of, of whole secure for those solutions, but uh, we're definitely here to help either way. Uh, and another question that has uh, been answered uh, before we hop over to some of the open questions is where's is the BPA found? So uh, Mr. McAllister did put a, a quick link there in how to run a BPA just to walk everybody through it. If you log into the customer support portal at support.paloaltonetworks.com, on the left-hand side under the tools section, you will see the best practice assessment and you will need a tech support file um, off of your firewall or panorama device to upload to that. But uh, I definitely recommend running those as, as regularly as you can. And by all means, feel free to reach out to your policy networks account team if you want some assistance running those or navigating them. Uh, you know, not only are uh, global protect settings covered in that, but every setting on the firewall is covered. So as you can imagine, those documents can be pretty, um, pretty large at, and, and maybe overbearing at first when you initially go through them, but we can definitely point you in the right directions on what specific aspects you should be focusing on, at least up front. Uh, da, 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 da. And Jennifer, absolutely, we definitely can. We'll follow up on that. So I'm going to go ahead and actually dismiss that question. All right. Um, so how does a client certificate offer multi-factor authentication security if it is deployed by the portal? Um, if a user had compromised credentials and an attacker logged into the Global Protect, wouldn't the attacker just receive the client cert as well? So, um, you know, Two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication, uh, whatever you would like to call it. But at, at the basic level, right, when you look at multiple factors of authentication, you look at having multiple of three things. It's uh, something you know, and, and this is trivial, of course, right, and probably part of the course for everybody here, but I'll just go over it. So it's something you know, something you have, something you are, right? So I know my password, I have a certificate, uh, and then something you are would be like I, my biometric scan. I have a, a fingerprint scanner on my, uh, on my uh, device or whatever the case may be. So uh, since you can utilize um, SCEP, right, SEEP, to push out certificates for a lot of these as well, uh, you don't actually have to necessarily have a, a certificate that is, a, you know, a long-lived certificate that SCEP can push out a certificate that is good for the day. So you can have the multiple factors of authentication, kind of that additional layer of trust um, through that. The other nice part about it though is, is we do have integrations. We have built-in integrations with the Octas and Ping IDs and Duos of the world, but any authentication service that utilizes Radius, so Google or Azure AD or whatever other authentication service you want to utilize, you can have that be a secondary authentication level too. And that can authenticate your user credentials. So you can still require it to have a certificate as well as the user credentials to log in, but to confirm your user, user credentials, you can use another factor of authentication on top of that. So that would even be pretty much three factors in that regards. Uh, Mr. McAllister, any, any thoughts or any additional add-ons there in that regards? Um, maybe the only other thing I can think of is just to kind of share one, one thing that we did to mitigate the, the scenario described in that question. Um, coming from, I worked at the Missile Defense Agency before coming here, and one of the things that we did, that this was years ago, so it was before, you know, companies like Okta, Ping, and Duo existed. Um, so we saw a lot of value in combining client-side certificates of the DOD organization. So we had to do that anyway, um, coupled with, you know, um, username and password. But for, for similar reasons, I think kind of driven by that question, we, we took that one step further and via hip checks, we would 
proactively look for a registry key. So as, as part of the base image, now granted these are all Windows and machines and we can do similar checks on Macs, but um, keep that in mind with my answer here, at least with Windows and Macs, we can check processes, we can check registry keys, we can ensure that it, you know, those devices are managed, they're yours, they're members of the domain before just, you know, issuing out another certificate. So um, any of those HIP checks do require the Global Protect license. So if you're running off of the free Global Protect, which is really more geared towards remote access VPN for Windows and Mac, um, that um, feature that I just described would not be available. But as long as you have the Global Protect license, I highly recommend if you haven't already look into those Global Protect um, HIP profiles and corresponding objects, literally dozens and dozens of things that you can check for. Um, you know, if, you're, if your internal device is a member of the domain, that user's creds are, are compromised and they have a foothold on the device, uh, you're in trouble. But um, assuming that the question is more geared toward the credentials, username and password are compromised and you're just trying to make sure that a certificate doesn't get handed out to a random device across the internet, you absolutely have plenty of ways to, to prevent that. Perfect. Thanks, Aaron. And a big thank to you to all of you. Uh, a, for all you do to keep your city, state, special district, um, you know, county government, higher ed, uh, K through 12, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of all the different organizations that we support, uh, whatever SLED, you know, state, local education, public sector uh, organization that you run. Thank you so much for all you do to keep that up and running. Um, it's, it's no easy task during these crazy times that we're all going through. So, a big thank you for all of to all of you. Um, a thank you to everybody that's uh, you know appreciative of all our work as well. We definitely try to do this to make you all um, successful. But uh, uh, a big shout out and thank you to Daniel Smith, Shane Markley, and Aaron McAllister for all the help and for honestly doing the heavy lifting on this webinar. Thank you all for joining. I greatly appreciate it. And, and again, Dan, Aaron, and Shane, thank you so much for your time too. Uh, other than that, everybody enjoy and have uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks again, David and others for helping host this wonderful webinar and the Q&A sessions. In case you missed the webinar itself, I'll be including a link to the webinar that this Q&A session came from. I'll also put some of the questions in the description as long as I can fit them. They will make them easier to search if you're searching around for any of the questions that were asked here. We hope that you were able to learn something today in these videos. As always, we welcome all questions and comments below. If you enjoyed watching this video, please give it a thumbs up and please subscribe to be notified of all of our new videos coming from the live community. Thanks again and have a great day.